You've talked about eligibility, uh, Kef. What would be if you could vote on the WRC? What would you want for Pacifica Rugby, Samoa, Tonga, Fiji? You've been living it now for a few years. What do you think we all need to do to actually get these proud nations back into the top eight or back into the top four? Look, we, we, we have a lot of players that leave our, our island at a young age um, and they, they, they're put in programs, in Wallaby programs, all black programs. We certainly don't begrudge them chasing that, that, that pathway. I mean, there's more money for them there. And, and essentially, that's why, that's, that's, that's what we want. You know, we want, we want those players to be able to earn that kind of money to support their families um, back in Tonga. What we want access to is probably the players that uh, are not good enough to, to play for the All Blacks or to the Wallabies. Um, those type of players are, could be very beneficial for us. And you know, if we could, if we had access to them, certainly leading up to the World Cup, would be would be a different team. Um, we'd also we'd also love to get our hands on those players who um, are stuck in that eligibility um, problems and issues. Um, players like Charles Puitau. George Moala and Co. Uh, we certainly love those players to come back and play for us. No, we've seen the emotion, you know, after the game. And, but how good was it? You know, you must be proud to, to, to be a Tonga when you see, uh, you know, your fans. You know, with the way they sort of danced the whole the whole night through, right through until even you know while after the after the game. Was that some of your family members, bro? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, uh, no, not really. But they're, they're your typical Tongan supporters. We. We love them, you know. They're, cra they're, they're crazy. They, whether we're we're winning by fifty, losing by fifty, losing by a hundred, they'll stay there to the end in the in the pouring rain to support us. And um, as long as it's not about the sport, it, at the end, it's just about representing your country with with a lot of pride and passion. Not a truer word said. And on that note, we'll end it. Tutai, thank you so much for coming and joining us. I know it was a difficult weekend, but we hope this weekend, I know you'll step up to the plate against Samar. All the very, very best. Thanks a lot, guys. Pleasure. That word, eligibility. Yeah, no, it can get, yeah, in, it sorry, can get all of us, sorry, but I think people. that's the key word we're talking about right now. And, and Hannah, you, you think about you know, some of the, the framework that everyone's talked about three or four years. Um, Sokopi Kipu was on the show. He talked about exactly the same thing. I mean, is it time now when they see, we're seeing results like that, that this conversation needs to get bigger and wider and countries need to come together and, and start working through how a solution can be found? Yeah, I think so. And, and actually sitting down with World Rugby and finding out what the issues are. Because we've been talking about this for a really long time. So um, actually bringing it to the table and having a, an open discussion about how we can all contribute to a better solution. I was just thinking then, and this might be stupid, but central contracting probably doesn't help. You know, because if you are playing for an NRL side and the majority of your money is coming from your club, then you can play for your country. And so maybe there's, we need to look at that central contracting, because what, you know, what, what Kev said is, New Zealand have the system that brings players through, and no one begrudges any one of that and good on them, but you know, if the majority of money's coming from the national body, you want to stay play for them. But if you actually, you know, born in Tonga and you're getting a lion's share of your money coming from your, your super side, then maybe that changes stuff. Well, um, Mills, he talked about, you know, we, we spoke to Tutai about the fact that he had about 30 players that approached, but because of their contractual situations, where they are, whether it's playing in New Zealand, whether it's playing in Japan, the moment they become an international player, all of a sudden their contract opportunities going forward change, don't they? So it's all of one of those things in New Zealand, I think you can only have three overseas players, and so that all of a sudden compromises their opportunity to get their next contract. These are, these are complicated situations for people who are trying to support their wider family. Oh, absolutely. And we, and we you talk about that and when you talk about you know the national body not really having that funding to be able to um, allow you to, to, to sort of that stability to, to play for your country and you know somewhere else does well of course you're going to go go down that track you know because you've spoken about it just then and we've, we've spoken about the eligibility rules for years and years this isn't just you know a 12 month conversation it's been ongoing for for many years but when you're getting paid more to go somewhere else like Japan or to Europe um, than, than what you're getting paid to play for the, your, your national team, you have to consider that. And for, for a lot of these guys, you know, what they're getting from the island nations are, are peanuts. You know? So it's, it becomes an easy decision. And when it jeopardises that contract to come back, 
of course it's going to be an easy one. You're not going to come back no matter how much you, you want to. These guys want to come back, but they have to support their families. They have to make a living and they have to do it in a short period of time. So why wouldn't you stay over there? OK, but where does, where does the WRC come into it here? Because, for example, Japan, their rule is if you have a test cap for anyone, you're not eligible, basically, or you're going to earn 100 grand less. So a lot of the Tongan and Samoan players go, no thanks, because it will cost them over their career hundreds of thousands of dollars. How, do we, how, does, how is that allowed? I don't understand how that is allowed, because it's basically so that they can pick, and I've done it, by the way, so hey, <laughs> I'm guilty, <laughs> you know, but you, you see the Tongans now going to Japan at 13. You'll see the Tongan community going to the NRL, to Australia. You know, like, we've got to start saying, well, is this sustainable? Is Tongan rugby sustainable if they're all going to play overseas? And if so, we've got to make the best players available. I think it also heightens the importance of Moana Pacifica and in, in really getting to the crux of that, right? Because these players do need to be in a 12-month programme. They need to, for their development. They need to be getting better... Um, playing rugby at, at the highest level they can and if there is another option in New Zealand which is not taking the opportunities away overseas then we need to start talking about this seriously. And that's the massive opportunity right now isn't it? The fact that we are waiting, we're waiting with bated breath to see whether or not this franchise is going to get the opportunity to be part of Super Rugby going forward. Let's look at some of the names, some of the former All Blacks that are now playing overseas which have links back to the island. Here's Tonga, here's some names, familiar names. Augustine Pulu, Charles Piatel, Frank Halai, Malachi Fikatoa, who is going to be eligible on the back of some sevens um, uh, opportunities that he will get around Olympic qualifiers. George Moala, Naoni Lamapi, and the likes of Via Fafita, who's just left the Hurricanes. You see some of those names, Mills, and we know you put three or four or five of those guys into a starting team, significant, significant improvements. Samoa's no different. Oh, absolutely. When you look at these guys, John, our fullest all game, Victor Vito, you know, Benson Stanley, you know, he's been out of there for, you know, I, don't know, I think you know, he played a limited amount of test matches for the All Blacks. But these are big names, you know. Uh, I, I, I tend to think, you know, OK, well, there needs to be a capping in terms of what, sort of how eligible they can be. But when you certainly put names like, like they have down there, and then another couple from, from uh, the Fijians as well, I mean, that's, a, that's, that's some pretty hearty sort of, I suppose, experience that they can actually share in Oh, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. I've just written down the back line. <laughs> uh, the number 10 from, sorry, I've forgotten his name, but he was really good on, on the weekend, I thought. Uh, then Moala, Piatau, the brother. Piatau, fullback, Halai on the wing. I mean, some talent, right? And then Solomon Akata. I mean, and that's I mean, what we're talking about. Do you think about. they'd be a little bit more con competitive, people? Yeah, but, but, yeah, but I, I absolutely believe it. But it's where do you start, though, Hannah? The fact that I'm the advocate, like, we saw Ma Nonu's name up there, and a lot of people would say, well, why would Ma Nonu want to do that? Well, I look at experience, and I think a lot of times that's what a lot of these teams lose and don't have. Do you want to get a guy who's maybe played four or five test matches? Yes, you'd love to have them. But what about the guy who's played 50 or 60 and come back into the environment? What can they offer, you know, Ma Nonu? 100 test matches, you look at those and go, you know what, for me, a couple of years in an environment, I think it's a game changer in terms of not just being a part of it, but aspirational for other players. Yeah, changing the leadership group, um, professionalism, bringing that level of development to the group. And for the young guys that are going to be in there, that's invaluable. I mean, a, a three-year stand-down, that's what Sokopi Kipu talked about, Mills. I mean, these are all simple things that have been discussed before, but surely, surely when you get results like that in the weekend, that should be the catalyst for change. Well, you think about that. I mean, you're looking at a three-year, uh, you know, stand-down for someone like Kama. I mean, he's really done it, you know. He's gone overseas, you know, for a very long time and he comes back in even if he didn't want to, want to you know, his, his contribution in terms of um, the experience he's, he's um, received from, you know, his playing days would be massive for, the, for, uh, for an island nation. So but this is where we've got to, they've got to start talking. You know, I hope they have, but, you know, again, you know, we've been talking about this for a very, very, for years and years, and we still haven't had a solution, albeit, you know, through a sevens qualifier, you know, only on an Olympic year. I mean, it's the only, that's the only thing we've got, gotten out of it, so... Yeah. Hopefully it, can, it starts. Well, I think the conversation needs to continue. World Rugby need to be a part of this because, bottom line, it can't be radio silence. You can't ignore the fact that you haven't invested enough in the islands to see the development that they deserve.